Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Very glad to have you with us for the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We've got good, kind of bad, mostly bad, I guess, but there's some good in there, too. And uh, definitely crazy for the third martini. And uh, Jim, let's start with the good. This actually happened on Wednesday, but other news intervened since then. Uh, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, who was a very pleasant surprise when he got elected in 2021. Hat tip Terry McAuliffe for telling parents they had no say in their kids' education. That definitely helped uh, provide some momentum there. One of the issues that he has been fiercely trying to address is the issue of how the Virginia General Assembly, when it was controlled by Democrats and Ralph Northam was governor, just decided that they were going to attach their vehicle environmental standards to the state of California. Well, now Glenn Youngkin has found a loophole to detach Virginia from those environmental standards, especially as it comes to electric vehicles basically because California is shifting to a new set of regulations. And since the legislation says Virginia may shift, but that doesn't have to, they're not going to shift to the new one. So first of all, here's Youngkin making the announcement on Wednesday. I have the privilege of announcing that we are ending once and for all the California electric vehicle mandate in Virginia. So now he's explains what was in these regulations, what would happen if Virginia didn't get out of these regulations, and why he's not discouraging EV sales or purchases. He just thinks Virginians deserve to make up their own minds. What has happened in the California regulations, which is the old regs, which are going to retire at December 31st this year, would have mandated that 22% of every car it sold in the Commonwealth of Virginia would be an electric vehicle, and the following year in 2026, it would have been 35% of every car sold in the Commonwealth of Virginia would have to be an electric vehicle. Now, listen, let me just be clear. I don't have anything against electric vehicles. If you want to buy an electric vehicle, buy one. If you want to buy a hybrid, buy one. If you want to buy a gas-powered engine and an an internal combustion engine, buy one. That's your choice. But when today 9% of automobiles in Virginia that are purchased are electric vehicles to turn around and mandate that 35% of them have to be electric vehicles, imposes an extraordinary economic burden on our dealers and on Virginians. And let me just be clear, the new regs that are going in place in California would penalize the system. Dealers, and we know where that's going to have to go to consumers, $20,000 for every single car that was below the threshold. Folks, 30,000 electric vehicles were sold last year. That would require 120,000 electric vehicles to be sold. That's 90,000 more electric vehicles that would otherwise have to be sold. And if they weren't, that's $1.8 billion of fines and penalties in a year that would be imposed on the system. So kind of a long clip there, but uh, Jim, that shows you the uh, draconian nature of the regulations. Uh, Duncan doing a good job there of giving consumers the, the choice and explaining that this was really a dumb idea from the start. Greg, first of all, I just want to point out, I, I don't mind that long clip in part because the voice in my head sounds like Glenn Youngkin yelling. <laughs> Why are we doing this? What? Who, whose idea was this? How? How? How does this make any sense? Yeah, that's that's what I get when I when I'm going through a lot of the news these day, a lot of days. And about you, you alluded to this earlier. Let's assume you're a Virginia Democratic state legislator and you think, by golly, you know, electric vehicles are just the the cat's pajamas, the very best, and you really don't like all your neighbors buying those SUVs and all that stuff. Well, if you're going to take a policy decision that imposes such costs on Virginians, that imposes, makes life so much harder for Virginia car dealers, that interferes with your choice to buy the kind of car that you want, own it, right? Do it yourself. Enact those kinds of, don't outsource it to, you know, California. Boy, I got to tell you, you know, why are Californians coming to Virginia, Greg? Because Californians are doing the jobs Virginians won't do, you know, (laughs) like enact asinine electric vehicle standards. That's problem number one. If you're going to do this, do this yourself. Don't just say, ah, because you know, you get the feeling this is being set up for, hey, look, I didn't make that rule. California did. I just made the rule that says we have to do what California does. Um, But just in generally, this entire philosophy, I I, I love the way Young can laid it out. Um, In almost every single policy decision, government must weigh the costs and the benefits. 
folks at places like the Competitive Enterprise Institute are always pointing out that, yeah, if you if, if, let's say you propose that no car physically could go more than 20 miles an hour. Would that save lives? Yeah, sure. You'd never have a high speed collision again. Car accidents would probably dramatically reduced, and uh, probably you'd uh, uh, you know have you know very fewer uh, you know, pedestrians hit. You'd also have all your milk spoiling because it wouldn't get there to the store. And you know, like <laughs> our, our entire lives would change with that. With the speed limit was twenty miles an hour. So you have to wait. You know, what do we get? What's the benefit? What's the upside? And what is the cost to everybody else when we enact this rule? And you know, as he put it, if you want to buy an electric vehicle, go ahead and do it. Now, I think it's worth noting, while there are some lower cost ones on the market, who, by the way, take, you know, take longer to recharge and don't stay charged as long, don't have the distance and all that stuff. To get the really nice ones, you know, the Teslas and stuff like that, they're really darn expensive. Now, if you choose, if you got the money to do it and you have the, you know, you want to do it, go right ahead. The government generally gives you, a, at least they used to give you a $7,500, you know, rebate on that because, you know, Tesla owners, the ones who need a break, uh, Greg, you know, they're the ones who've really been hurting. <laughs> Sorry, Elon. Um, and just kind of this, this, you know, this sense that it's one thing to say, I care about the environment and I believe this choice is best for me. Therefore, I'm going to make it. It's another thing to say, I'm going to impose this choice on you. And that's what we see in this work. That, that is what is at work in this stuff is like, you know, we're, you know, I, I, it's not enough for me to take the choices that I believe in. I want to impose choices on you. And we see this all across the environmental movement where they're saying, you know, well, really, you know, people should be eating bugs. And they should not be allowed to eat Big Macs or, or meat or stuff like that. Your decision to have a Big Mac for lunch is going to have such a small impact on the carbon input and, and the entire cost of the environment that it basically can't be measured. There are a bunch of other stuff we can do to improve the environment. But really, your decision to buy a Big Mac, your decision to buy an SUV and drive around in the SUV all you want is nothing compared to the typical private jet, you know, that someone's flying. Somebody like, mm, I don't know, John Kerry. Presidential Special Envoy on Climate Change. We point out this stuff and not a single Green ever really wants to deal with it because it's really an inconvenient truth. Also, the environmentalists keep buying beachfront property. Yeah, exactly. And uh, not just John Kerry. We had toyed around with uh, another story today of uh, the First Lady. She was with uh, the president yesterday in Normandy. She's flying back to sit at Hunter Biden's trial in Wilmington today, and then she's flying back to France. <laughs> so I don't know what that carbon footprint looks like, Jim, but it's bigger than our lifetime yes. ones. Yes. <laughs> So spare us the lectures, Mr. President. All right, Jim, on to our second martini. It's bad in some ways. It's decent in some ways. It's hard to tell, depending on where you look. Uh, The May job numbers are in, and Politico's framing of the story is job growth blows past expectations, boosting Biden, but dimming rate cut hopes. And so the report for May is that U.S. employers added 272,000 jobs in May, shattering expectations. However, the overall unemployment rate is at uh, 4% now. It had been under 4 for quite a long time. And now they say, well, because job growth is so robust, we're not going to get interest rate cuts. So buying that car, electric, internal combustion or otherwise, is going to be a lot more expensive and certainly buying homes as well. Meanwhile, Heather Long over at the Washington Post, who does a really good job of crunching these numbers, uh, says, yeah, I mean, those numbers uh, exceeded expectations. Also, uh, there's some bad news. Number one, the 4% unemployment rate. First of all, while there were job gains, uh, the month brought us a negative 250,000 in the labor force and also a loss of 408,000 total in people employed. And the overall labor force participation rate fell to 62 0.5%. And so what's going on here is there's two different surveys. There's the establishment survey where the businesses report jobs uh, that were created in the household survey of workers, which shows things that she says is cooling off. And she says this is, you know, something to watch going forward uh, as to whether the economy really is cooling off significantly. So depending on where you read, Jim, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, a Rorschach test to worry on the economy. And of course, for uh, the Biden administration, we're just a few months from Election day, everything's hunky dory. If you don't want Joe Biden to win, uh, everything is horrible, and uh, it's just a matter of where the trends are. And it looks like Heather Long, I think, has put her finger on some stuff here. Yeah, look, when we when Greg pitched this in our our emails about taping today's show, I felt like I responded. I felt like the day, the monthly jobs report it feels a lot like Groundhog Day. We we have the same kind of going around in circles because generally the, the news is pretty good. There's job creation. It's not. Uh, overwhelming gangbuster numbers most months, but it's pretty good. Um, but it also, a lot of it is part-time jobs. 
Um, they don't break it down. Like a certain number are, are to foreign workers, they say. And they don't really specify whether it's legal immigrants or illegal immigrants. I, I think for a lot of us, that's a very big difference. Um, number of, of, you know, native born Americans is not necessarily keeping up. That's which is not great news. Um, but generally, you know, and 4%, eh, you know, it's been really low. Four per, you, usually we were in that 4 to 6% for a very long, uh, wrong, long range. Skyrockets because of uh, COVID. COVID ends and it goes back down again and actually goes down to very low levels. You know, 3%. You can even find it in 2% in certain states and communities. But, you know, it's starting to inch up about a tenth of a point. Uh, the workforce participation rate dropping a bit makes me worried. Um, it just, it, you know, it's not disastrous, but but there's a little bit of a rattle in the engine, a couple of stuff that just seems kind of ominous. Uh, but by and large, I think you could look at the U.S. economy during the Biden years and you could say, hey, unemployment is not really the problem. Inflation is the problem. And inflation has been a really big problem, maybe even an era defining problem for much of the past three years. It's now down to 3.4%, 3.6%, something like that, which is significantly lower than the 9% that it was. But it's still high, like traditionally 0 to 2% is where we wanted it to be. 3.6% isn't terrible, but it's still there. And by the way, people who go to the grocery store, still, oh, they still see it there. It's amazing how often people point out fast food prices. Uh, people miss the $1 menu at McDonald's. People, yeah. you know, the noted economist, Sauce Gardner, um, who, who <laughs> you know, he does. He also plays cornerback for the New York Jets. He does that too. But he, just, you know, he just went on this, you know, little rant about how he's, he doesn't like to get political. But under Trump, we can afford stuff, and it was just kind of this, you know, I think it's kind of revealing. I think a lot of people feel that way, and I think that's a big factor in um, how Trump is doing. By the way, we're just talking about uh, uh, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin. Uh, Virginia's been a blue state, other than the governor's race, for a really long time. My gut instinct is that this is not going to be that competitive a state. Biden won it comfortably last time. Hillary won it comfortably. And yet, I, I just this, this is a public service announcement for, for listeners. The latest Fox News poll that just came out has it a tie, 48-48. Now, what makes this a little more interesting is in May, Roanoke College did a poll and had it come out 42-42. The other ones before then had, you know, VCU way back in, in December. Jan People don't poll Virginia that often, folks. Um, the Virginia, Biden was up by three. These are not huge numbers. I st I still think Virginia is going to stay blue, but it feels that you know that old saying: um, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three is enemy action. If you see a third straight poll that has Virginia tied, sit up and take notice. But then it becomes a pattern. Then it becomes something that indicates: wow, Biden really is weaker than usual in a state. As one of my colleagues put, is like, look, when you're sending military aid to Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel. And you still aren't picking up the defense contractor vote. That's when you know people are really PO'd with you. So, uh, but just generally looking at this state of the, this overall state of the economy, the Biden campaign is going to spike the football and say, "Look, another great month of job creation." And they're not technically wrong, but that's not really the problem people are feeling about the economy. People are feeling like they can't afford anything. You know, everything everything's more expensive than it used to be, and they don't feel like their wages are keeping up with the uh, the pace of inflation. There'll be this whining from the Biden campaign. Oh, why, why isn't anybody giving us credit for the economy? Uh, well, because everything feels unaffordable. And until you address that, you're probably going to be in very weak shape for a re-election. So you know, we, we'll see. And again, we are taping this on June 7th, 2024. This is not a rerun. This is not a greatest hits. I know it feels like our monthly job report segment sounds similar, but that's because the monthly job reports are pretty similar from month to month. Yeah, people just in general polls are not satisfied with the economy. They're certainly not satisfied with the president's handling of it. And when that's the case, it's usually not a good sign for the incumbent. And so I don't think there's a ton of base enthusiasm for Biden. It's the question of whether his base is sufficiently ginned up in revulsion to Trump to get out there anyway, because uh, mm. that I think that was their bigger motivator in 2020 than, oh, Joe Biden, he seems like he's totally at the top of his game. Absolutely, we want him. Um, so... If you want to change people's minds about the economy, you're kind of getting to the point where you need to change it. Uh, if mm. you think you're going to be able to do it after Labor Day, no, that doesn't work that way. The Democrats are counting on your economic ignorance so they can get reelected. The Watchdog on Wall Street podcast with Chris Markowski. Every day, Chris helps unpack the connection between politics and the economy and how it affects your wallet. The left wants you to think that oil companies and grocery stores are ripping Americans off. Meanwhile, they just want to get back into office to keep printing trillions of more dollars. Whether it's happening in D.C. or down on Wall Street, it's affecting you financially. Be informed. Check out the Watchdog on Wall Street podcast with Chris Markowski on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast.
All right, Jim, on to our crazy martini now and the subject of your morning jolt today. Uh, it seems like just about everything, and it seems that way because it generally is, that everything the left touches just gets ruined. Um, <laughs> and entertainment is no different. Once Hollywood went woke, uh, things got worse and less interesting. And then not quite in that in, in the midst of that really awful cycle of everything was either a remake or a sequel uh, that was going on for year after year after year. But everything it touches still gets worse. The latest example of this, and, and this is kind of your jumping off point in the Joel today, is that Disney owns Star Wars. So, of course, they can't stop turning out Star Wars related material. And most of it stinks. Let's be honest. Since 1983 and Return of the Jedi, almost everything, at least in my opinion, of, related to Star Wars has stunk. From the prequels, although the, the third one's passable, the first two are awful. To me, seven and eight were so were, were just so bad I didn't even bother with episode nine. I liked Rogue One, Solo, and eh, okay. Uh, I like The Mandalorian. I haven't seen Kenobi, uh, and some people have said that is good. But for the most part, uh, when you just start cranking out all this stuff, quality is going to suffer. And it has. And now uh, there's this new uh, Star Wars series called The Acolyte. And the creator and the star are just brazenly out there saying that, yeah, we're going to just uh, do an agenda here. This is going to be the gayest Star Wars ever. And so, Jim, you you you, you dive into that brazen uh, cultural advocacy in, in your piece as well. But also you point out that because they focus on these areas and they want to celebrate characters and celebrate diversity as they see it, it makes people really boring. <laughs> and these characters yeah. are boring and nobody wants to watch it. Well, first of all, my first reaction, Greg, is, oh, you said no like a jar, jar beans, sir? Huh? You know. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, although I, I would point out, so, you know, you and I are roughly the same age. We're Generation X. We grew up with Star Wars, grew up mm -hmm. wanting to be. The question, the question was not, did you want to grow up to be a Harrison Ford character? The question was, which <laughs> Harrison Ford, did you want to grow up to be Han Solo? Did you want to grow up to be Indiana Jones? Or were you that weird kid whose parents let him see Blade Runner and you wanted to be Rick? <laughs> those were those were the career options, you know? Um, and so, you know, all right, I, I will, my only defense I'll make of the prequels is that I went to see, they, they, they re-released episode one in 3D in theaters. And my older teenager was real little then and was entranced and loved it. So I'm like, okay, maybe part of the problem is that I am a increasingly middle-aged man now. And I'm not eight, seven or eight, nine or 10 years old. Like, you know, that's, that's the real reason I'm not enjoying Star Wars the way I did. I actually thought Force Awakens was pretty darn good. We, we can agree to disagree on that one. I thought Rogue One was pretty darn good. I felt yeah. like there was, oh, okay, there's potential. You can put Star Wars in the hands of different creators, different creative minds and get some good stories out of it. But I don't think there are too many Star Wars fans who would dispute that the quality has generally deteriorated. You see it in the box office. The only good news about The Rise of Skywalker was that it basically was J.J. Abrams giving a middle finger to Ryan Johnson the entire time and undoing <laughs> everything that happened in the previous movie and you know the the uh, the last Jedi and saying no hey everything we told you never mind never mind it's totally it's to everything you heard there was lies you know this this kind of the, you might as well just call it Star Wars the do over um or, or Star Wars the apology from JJ Abrams um but in particular I don't think Star Wars has gotten better since they started doing Disney Plus series which is weird because I loved the first two seasons of the Mandalorian you know, a lot, it's, you know, a lot of Star Wars stories are about, you know, Jedi and this grand destinies and, you know, your, your sense of your call to save the universe. The story of the Mandalorian is about a single dad driving a minivan who wants to find a good school for his kid. I'm just saying they're very related and everybody in the world is giving him grief. And in order to get his kid anywhere he needs to go, he's got to do this. Then he's got to do this favor for this person. And I was like, I just say. You know, Jin Jarin, I relate to you, okay? I, I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> but the other series, it does feel like these TV series have gotten worse. It feels like generally that there's like maybe two or three episodes where the plot that gets stretched out over six or so. Book of Boba Fett, a lot of people really meh on. Third season of Mandalorian felt like he was a supporting character in his own series. If you'd said to me, hey, we're going to get Ewan McGregor and we're going to do a series about young Obi-Wan Kenobi, I think everybody, oh my goodness, that came and went. And I don't, I, I think I watched the first two episodes and I didn't finish. My kids are not into Star Wars anymore. I heard a lot of people raving about Andor. If you liked it, great. Never got into it. Ahsoka came and went. Feels like it went with a yawn. It just feels like there, there was no, 
buzz. There's no one saying, oh, my God, this is so good. You got to, you know. And now we have the Acolyte, which is supposed to be set 100 years before the prequels. Whole new creators, whole new environment, you know, uh, and it's supposed to catch on. And I, I think Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, is probably going to hire Boba Fett to hunt down the creator of the Acolyte and the star <laughs> after they chose to do an interview and to say that this show is the gayest Star Wars but I think Star Wars is so gay already, Stenberg told the Raps Drew Taylor in a recent interview. I mean, have you seen the fits? I assume that's short for outfits. We'd be like, look how gay this is and send each other reference photos. Are you telling me with a straight face that C-3PO is straight? Series creator Leslie Edlund asked. Now, here's the thing. If you have a fan base that's gotten kind of disillusioned, that kind of feels like it's woke messaging over the old fashioned fun and excitement, who often maybe sometimes felt like even there's some things that are in there that are not age appropriate and that this was a show that we all fell in love with as kids. It is its heart. It is a kid. Like, like if you're an adult fan, great. But mostly this, this show was this Star Wars was created for kids. It's got wizards. It's got pirates. It's got robots. It's got spaceships. It's got monsters like this. This is old fairy tales updated in, in a, in a you know, sci fi environment. And, and what, you know, like going out and say, this is the gayest Star Wars ever. I'm trying to think of a worse sales pitch. I'm trying to think this is the Star Wars series that really gets you to relate to Hamas. Might be the, a worse sales pitch. But yeah, it's just what this fan base doesn't want. Now, I haven't watched The Acolyte. I did check a couple of guys on YouTube who do, generally do very snarky reviews. The Critical Drinker is one, but there's a bunch. And you really can't find, like, they're not saying... It's an endless woke fest. Uh, ironically, they're not complaining about it being, quote unquote, the gayest Star Wars ever. They just feel like it's very flat, boring characters. It doesn't, the pacing is slow and, but like, can I put it, it's Star Wars, right? Like within five minutes of the first movie, we, we were rooting for R2-D2 and C-3PO, right? Mm -hmm. Within five minutes of meeting Luke, we both like him and want to smack him for whining about power converters. <laughs> Within two minutes of meeting Han Solo, we're like, this is the coolest man we've ever seen. And we want a buddy like Chewbacca. And we love the way Princess Leia isn't intimidated by, by Darth Vader. Like, you know, like w George Lucas, whatever else his flaws, and I think we can say from the prequels, he has his flaws, figured out how to get you to like a character really quickly. And very few of these new series have figured that out. And part of, I think one of the problems is, and this is kind of the broader point, well beyond Star Wars. I think this applies to Marvel, almost any series. Once you create something, you talk about what a character is a great triumph for representation. The character's gay, the character's trans, the character's, you know, it's a minority character in a, in a role we've never seen them before. Very often that makes a character boring. No, no, I, I suppose conceivably you could make it that. But generally when this person is the first gay character in your television series, well, you can't make that character too flawed or else people will think you're making that statement about gay characters. Oh, the character's a kleptomaniac? Are you saying gays are kleptomaniacs? You know. So when you have a character who's a triumph for representation, they tend to be nice. They tend to not have any flaws or, or complications or something like that. They tend to be cookie cutter. They tend to be, you know, you're, you, you can't have any anything bad attached to this character. So they end up being really uninteresting. They're not compelling. There's nothing kind of, and also the, oftentimes they can be so right that they're not um, relatable. Uh, there's a common lament in, in film critics series about the idea of the girl boss character, uh, the character who's young and female and starts out good at everything. Some people characterize this as the Mary Sue. Um, it came out of fan fiction, the idea that like a, a screenwriter creates a character who's themselves and there's nothing worse than that from anybody who's read the Dangerous Quick series. Um, <laughs> the idea of you know, they create a character and that character is perfect. I think if, if you know, I, I'm joking about the, the Dangerous Click series, I think people can recognize Alex Flanagan is a deeply flawed protagonist who's always biting off more than he can chew. And the only thing that gets him out of it is his wisecracking ability. Um, and very much like in real life, his wife gets him out of trouble a bunch of times. Anyway, <laughs> the but the point being that you create this character who's, who's too perfect, who, who's not relatable, who is not flawed, who's not interesting. Now you think about all the different characters, you know, you've fallen in love with from movies and fiction over the years. Like a part of it is their flaws. A part of it is how you relate to them. They're like, ah, you know, and also like in almost every story, the character has to have a character arc. They need to be on some internal emotional journey that parallels the external journey. And to use the most important work in Western civilization, John McClane in the beginning of Die Hard is not a good husband. Right? He did not believe in his wife's ability to go to work at Nakatomi. 
Right. She wanted to move for the job. He said, it's never going to work out. Stays in New York. She takes the kids. And he's lost his family. And he's kind of angry at himself about it. He's angry about her. But he comes back at Christmas kind of hoping to reconcile. And at the end, he, can't, you know, he like we know he isn't ever really going to be able to go out and get Hans Gruber until he tells Al, I screwed up. I didn't, you know, believe in my wife. When he talked to him over the walkie-talkie. Like, that, that emotional journey is every bit as important as shooting the bad guys in the head. And that's what makes a great story. And I think that when you start out with the idea that your main character is perfect and your main character is so good at everything and is there to tell all the other characters how uh, how good they are, to show, like, that's boring. And I feel like we've seen it. I, I don't know if this is necessarily what's at work in the Acolyte, but I do feel like there is... There's less of a journey. And I kind of wonder if the screenwriters who are in Hollywood right now, I wonder if they get this. And I want, the other thing is also like when you go out and you're bragging, this is the gayest Star Wars ever. I, how big a demographic do you think are going to look at that and say, yes! And how much of a demographic do you think are going to go, ah, oh, great, you know. Um, Hey, we're all fine here now. How are you, as Han would say? Yeah, you're totally right about the complicated characters. It makes things so much more interesting. You know, Jack Bauer, I mean, he was always right about which lead he was following. But in terms of his interpersonal relationships, mm -hmm. <laughs> those were a train wreck a, a lot of the time. That's uh, that's why Kim ran to the, the Puma. The Puma was a better <laughs> father figure. And also, like, even when he would do the right thing, like, it was also very important that they demonstrate, like, it had a moral cost to him. It had a, it, it, it oh, was yeah. emotional and psychological burden of all the bad things he felt obligated to do to protect his guy. Like, that's a fascinating character because there's that inner conflict and you're always kind of wondering, is this when Jack is going to snap? Yeah, absolutely right. Good observations. Good observations. So, Jim, uh, we've reached the weekend. And so I know what you're not watching, but uh, hopefully you find some good entertainment uh, this weekend. Uh, have a good weekend. See you Monday. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast. If you don't already, tell your friends about us as well. Thanks also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us both on X. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great weekend and join us again on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.